Welcome everybody to the Design Plus Accessibility Summit 2021. I'm Peter Wu from the PowerPoint team at Microsoft, and today I'm going to talk to you about how you can empower people to achieve more by making your PowerPoint presentations accessible. Design your content to include these people because they could have difficulty understanding your content if you don't. For people with low vision or color blindness, examine contrast and use of color. For people with very low or no vision, make it work with a screen reader. And for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, add captions. Let's start by examining contrast and use of color so that people who have low vision or color blindness can understand your content better. People like April and Rodrigo. My name is April Brockoft. Um, I'm a member of the Microsoft Visually Impaired Persons community. I have low vision. Uh, so what that means is that my visual acuity is bad enough such that I cannot operate a vehicle and drive myself around. And I also have some color vision deficiencies. Um, I'm on the Azure Sphere team. I run some of the engineering services. So a lot of work in Azure DevOps, uh, constructing build pipelines and administering code repositories. Hello everyone. My name is Rodrigo Santos. I'm a global cloud solution architect on the customer architecture engineering team. And we work with Microsoft's uh, top enterprise customers on Azure engagements, helping them to be successful on the Azure platform. Most of my activities require that I prepare and deliver presentations, um, architecture diagrams, especially training and deep dive uh, discussions uh, with customers. So I'm a colorblind and I also have a low level of astigmatism and I usually need my glasses when working or playing games. Otherwise, things will get a little blurry, uh, especially small text. So then I always try to create and deliver contents that are uh, actually as much accessible as possible. And I use the accessibility check tool in PowerPoint a lot, and sometimes even use the accessibility insights tool, which allows me to validate color combinations, contrast, and a lot more. The industry standard is for text that's large, that's 18 point or 14 point bold or larger, and graphics that are important for understanding meaning to be at least three to one contrast, and text that's smaller than that to be at least 4.5 to one contrast. If the contrast isn't high enough, some people may have difficulty reading it or even perceiving that it's there. Let's take a look at an example. There have been some other instances of complex architecture diagrams where the contrast wasn't so great, and it was a little hard to perceive that there was text at all in some of the block diagrams. And so it was very hard to follow. Let's look at some examples in PowerPoint now. I have this message on the status bar that says accessibility investigate. What's happening is accessibility checker is running in the background while I work. When I click this item, it opens the accessibility checker pane, which shows me the full list of issues. There's hard to read text contrast issues. When I click on them, I can get commands to fix the problem. For example, choose a darker fill color, and that makes the text contrast three to one or higher. And now the issue no longer appears in the list in Accessibility Checker. We've recently rolled out a change where Accessibility Checker runs in the background by default. But if it's not on for you, you can still get to the Accessibility Checker pane by going to the Review ribbon and clicking Check Accessibility. There's another hard to read text contrast issue on slide five. I'll click on it to go there, and then I'll go to the accessibility ribbon at the top of the screen to find the command to help fix that problem. The accessibility ribbon is a new place that brings together the commands you need to fix accessibility issues in PowerPoint presentations. It's rolling out to insiders now in PowerPoint for Windows version 21.10 and Mac PowerPoint version 16.55. In this case, the text is less than 18 points, so I need to choose a darker color and make the contrast at least 4.5 to 1. On this slide, I have a picture with some negative space in it, and I've placed a message inside that area. 
So pretty clever technique, but fortunately, Accessibility Checker can't detect the contrast in that automatically. So I'm going to have to check the contrast manually, and I'll show you a way you can do that. Uh, there's a free app called Color Contrast Analyzer that I can run. And I can use the eyedropper tools to select the two colors that I want to compare. I'll choose the colors near the bottom left corner where the background is lightest. And I can see that the contrast is a little lower than 3 to 1. I can switch to HSL and change the lightness value so that the contrast is at least 3 to 1. I can get the hex value of that color. And now I can go and copy paste that uh, back into PowerPoint and set that as my text color. So it's a little bit more work, but there is a way that you can manually check the contrast of the color and adjust the color to meet contrast requirements. Here's another example where it's important to uh, have high enough contrast to understand the content. There is a line under the word durable, and that indicates that that's the selected trait that I'm drilling down into. And if I can't see that line, it's hard to understand this content. Again, Accessibility Checker can't detect the contrast issue automatically, so you have to use the manual process with a tool like Color Contrast Analyzer to go detect the issue and then choose a darker color to fix the issue. And this is what it looks like after you choose the darker color and fix that issue. Now you can easily see which is the selected trait and understand the slide. So at least in that version, it appears as if there's a, a tab. Yep. You know, at least I can see that there is an un underline under durable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, really good. And for and the first one was that just not coming through or? Oh, not at all. I I, I was waiting for the speech to address all three, and the fact that all three weren't addressed was very confusing. Ah, uh, yeah, exactly. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> On this slide, it's hard to understand the message of the slide unless you can see the two circles. The contrast of the first circle to the background is 1.3 to 1, and the contrast of the second slide to the background is 1.2 to 1. In both cases, it's much too low uh, to meet the requirement of graphics that are important for understanding meaning being 3 to 1 contrast. So to fix this problem, what I could do is choose some darker colors that are at least three to one contrast. So now the first uh, circle is three to one contrast. The second circle is 3.3 .3 to one contrast. And now they both meet that requirement. Um, but unfortunately, it's caused another problem, which is that the, the contrast of the text to the fill color is now below three to one. So in the process of fixing one contrast issue, I've introduced another contrast issue. What I can do to fix that problem is change the text color. If I flip that from black to white, now it has enough contrast compared to the colors of the circles. But honestly, I kind of liked the diagram with the lighter color circles. Here's what we can do to make that um, diagram with the lighter colors meet the contrast requirements. I still have 1.3 to 1 contrast of the fill color of the first circle with the background. But I've added a black outline to the circle. And if you look at the contrast of the black outline with the background, and the contrast of the black outline with the fill of the circle, both of those are very high contrast. And only one of these three color pairs needs to be at least three to one contrast to make it so that a 
circle boundary is visible. And since two of the three meet the three to one contrast requirement, I have a visible boundary and it meets the contrast requirements. I can do the similar kind of comparison on the second circle and see that it also meets contrast requirements. So this is a way that I can stick with those light colors um, and still meet the contrast requirements. Remember that adding outlines gives you that additional uh, versatility and flexibility. Accessibility Checker can find common color contrast issues such as uh, text with or without highlights, with or without hyperlinks, in text boxes, shapes, tables, and smart arts, with solid and opaque fills. So use Accessibility Checker because it's going to help you find all those issues automatically. But also be aware that Accessibility Checker cannot find all color contrast issues. Uh, it doesn't find issues whenever there's transparency or non-solid fills like a gradient. Um, it can't find color contrast issues with graphics or text and charts or compositions of multiple objects and the background. So if you see something that looks like it might have too low contrast and you aren't sure, um, check it manually using a tool such as Color Contrast Analyzer. And that way you can be sure that all of your content meets contrast requirements. Now, let's take a closer look at what the 4.5 to 1 contrast and 3 to 1 contrast requirements mean in terms of what colors you get to choose from uh, when you are designing your content. If you can choose black or white as one of your colors, uh, either for the text or for the background, then that gives you the maximum amount of room to work with um, when choosing the other color to pair it with. If you choose black, then you can choose a light gray or a light red, light green, or light blue color. You get to choose from about half of the colors. Um, the midpoint is a little different depending on the color because green has a lot more lightness than blue, for example, but it's uh, you know roughly half the colors you get to choose from. And if you are using white, then you have to choose one of the dark grays, dark reds, dark greens, or dark blues. And that's the other half. So there isn't a whole lot of overlap between those two ranges of colors. So almost no colors can um, be 4.5 to 1 contrast with both black and white. 4.5 to 1 contrast essentially splits the spectrum in half. And you, you can either you know, pair the light colors with black or pair the dark colors with white. With 3 to 1 contrast, it splits the spectrum into thirds. So there's a wider range of colors that you can use with black and a wider range of colors you can use with white. And the band of colors in the middle that you are able to use with both black and white. So it gives you some more flexibility in terms of what colors you can work with. That brings me to this design tip, which is to make your text at least 18 point or 14 point bold, and then you only need to meet the three to one contrast requirement, which means you have a larger range of colors to select from. It's already a great require, um, uh, practice to use uh, a, a, a small amount of text at a large font size on your slides so that you don't um, you know, distract the user trying to read a complex message. Uh, and instead, they can pay attention to you talking during the presentation. And this is just yet another reason to stick with the larger font sizes and it just gives you more flexibility in terms of colors to work with. On this slide, we have red circles and green circles, with red meaning bad and green meaning good. It's very common for people to code information and colors in this way. 
I'm going to go into Windows and turn on the grayscale color filter. And that's going to simulate the effect of someone with monochromacy, a form of colorblindness, where you can't perceive the different colors. When I go back and view the slide in grayscale mode, it becomes apparent that it's hard to understand the message without being able to perceive the different colors. Uh, if there's indicators, um, I thought all three dots there were the same. Is right. this the same color? Because I'm colorblind, I cannot see it, or is there, you know, there is something else? Okay. This one is different, this one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really hard for me to see it, so I can't see okay. it. For me, if I do not look closely, very close, I cannot identify the different colors do instead is communicate that information using shapes. So the warning sign means bad and the check mark means good. It's okay to continue to communicate the information using red and green colors, but the red and green colors aren't the only thing I'm using to convey the information. I also have shape. So now when I view this slide um, in grayscale, I can understand the message even if I can't uh, perceive the different colors. So which of the trends do you think is um, trending in the right direction? There we go, income. Absolutely, they're much, a lot, of, a lot easier. And that's what I'll, I'll, I'll suggest, you know, if, if the, the time has been a problem, instead of using a red, use an mm -hmm. icon like this and it's still in a red color. Here's a chart uh, that is conveying information using color alone in the uh, legend of the chart. If I uh, view this in grayscale, I'll realize I can't understand the chart. When I go to read the legend, I can't tell which is which, and now I don't know which line of the chart uh, to look at for each series. Which product line do you think is doing the best? I have absolutely no idea. I'm going to show you a few different ways that you could format this chart in a way that people who are colorblind would be able to read. So in the first technique, I'm going to select uh, a series in the chart and choose a different line style. I'll go to more lines and open up the format pane, and then I can choose a compound line style, for example. Uh, so I can select another series, and I can apply, for example, a dotted line style. And by having these different line styles, now it's easy to distinguish the different series, even if I can't perceive the different colors. I'll show you another example. I've inserted some SVG pictures of some basic shapes here on the slide, a star, a circle, and a plus sign. And what I can do is take these pictures and apply them as markers to the data points in the chart. All I have to do is select the picture, copy, and then select the series and paste. And now that uh, picture has been applied as a marker to all the data points in that series. So I just do that for the others. And now I am communicating the series through the shape as well as the colors. Here's one more example. I'm going to select a series and then select just the last data point. And then I'm going to add a data label uh, to the right side. And that's going to show me the value. But I'm going to go to the Format pane, and I'm going to select the series name rather than the value. And now I can do that same technique to the other two series. And I will have the series name next to each line in the chart. And so that's a whole lot easier to read than having to First, go to the legend and figure out which color is associated with each series, and then map that to the lines in the chart. I don't have to go through that level of indirection, 
And in fact, you know, after I've added all these labels, I can actually select the legend in the chart and delete it because I don't need it anymore. And so even without that legend and even without the ability to perceive the different colors, I can easily read the chart and understand it. So that's what you need to do in terms of examining contrast and use of color to help people understand your content better. Which of the three product lines do you think is doing the best? Serene. Much better. I don't have to look at two different places and see well, what color is it. Much better, absolutely. In the initial version, we had pretty much all the lines using the same, same, um, the same model, the same style, just different colors. And then I suggested to the guys, hey, let, let me help you guys out with this because I, I cannot identify which ones you're talking about in this legend. Since the, the, uh, the line style is also different, it makes a lot easier for me to you know, clearly follow the path for the traffic. Using not just different colors, different shapes, different line styles, different arrows, all that is going to make easier for us to, um, um, you know, attend presentations and easily understand what presenters are trying to share with us. Now I'm going to jump into how to make your presentation work with a screen reader. People with very low or no vision rely on a screen reader to understand the content. But the content needs to have a meaningful and logical structure, order, and textual descriptions for it to make sense using a screen reader. I'm going to give you some examples and show you how you can examine it and fix problems with it to make your content work great with a screen reader. First, make sure that every slide has a unique and meaningful title. Screen reader users rely on the title as they are navigating through the presentation to figure out where they are. As they go from slide to slide, the title gets read, and if there is no title, they can easily lose track of where they are. So on this slide, I can go and click the slide title button on the accessibility ribbon, and that's how I find out there's already a title object on the slide, great. Um, if I want to make some edits and make it a little more unique, I can do that. But uh, it's easy to go and figure out if a slide already has a title. Now, if I look in the accessibility checker pane, I can see there's missing slide titles for some of the slides. This one has this large text box, and I think it's the title, but actually it isn't. And, but once I click the slide title button on the accessibility ribbon, it takes that selected object and turns it into the title. If you look in the outline pane on the left, you can see that the title is the bold text to the right of the slide icon. Now that's a good way to confirm that I've made this large text box into my slide title. I'll go back to the accessibility checker and check the next missing slide title. On this slide, I don't want to turn that text box into the title. I want to add a new title. And so I can choose Add Slide Title from the dropdown. And then I can type my title. So that's easy to do. Next, I'll look at the last missing slide title issue listed in the Accessibility Checker. I click on that. And I don't want to have a slide title appear on the slide. What I can do is choose Add Hidden Slide Title. That adds a title object, but it's positioned off the slide. So I can see it here in Edit View, and it'll be read aloud for the screen reader user. But when I present in Slideshow, it doesn't show up. So whether you want a title to appear on your slide or not, add a title to the slide so that screen reader users we'll be able to easily navigate through the presentation. To understand this slide, you need to read it in the right order. 
and I have carefully laid out how the objects are um, positioned spatially so that it's easy to read. But the problem is that there's an internal ordering to these objects that doesn't necessarily match the spatial ordering of the objects. And in fact, just looking at the slide, you can't tell what that internal ordering is. And that internal ordering is uh, what order the screen reader will read the objects in, the reading order. And uh, it could be quite random, and I wouldn't even know it. Um, but it's going to make it really hard to understand for a screen reader user. Let's listen to how the screen reader reads this slide. Slide 11 of Anar's Way. It's not just what we do, but how we do it that makes all the difference. Execute. Blueprint. Image. Provide with conveniency and outstanding service. Thoroughly research and thoughtfully design. Efficiently produce with attention to every detail. Deliver. Plan. A large room with a large table and chairs description automatically generated with low confidence. Image. So it's hard to understand, and I think the weird order is really throwing me off. So let's see what we can do about that. In PowerPoint, in the Accessibility Checker pane, there's a section called Check Reading Order. And so if I click into that section, I can see a warning for the slide, and there's a command to help fix that. It's both in the accessibility checker and on the accessibility ribbon. Clicking on that opens up the reading order pane, and that lists the objects in the internal order. So I'm clicking through the objects now, and I can see what that order is. And it's not the order that I want, so I can make changes to that uh, to get the order that I want. Before I do the reordering though, I want to address some other issues first. There's a lot of warning signs on these uh, elements and I want to address those first. So there's these three freeform objects. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to group them together. Then I'm going to click on the group item and I'm going to add alt text for the group. So the, it's not the individual freeform shapes that's communicating the message. It's really the three freeform shapes together that forms the delivery truck that's communicating the message. So that it's, um, creating that logical structure is really important to understanding the content. So look for how to uh, group your objects into logical units. And then you can add alt text to them so that, that there's a textual description associated with it. So I'll click on the next item with the warning sign. And this is just an icon that's missing some alt text. So I'll add the alt text. And I'll click on this picture. And it already has alt text. But this was automatically generated by the AI service when I first inserted the picture. And the description is actually pretty accurate, but I want to use this specific product name instead. So I'm going to change that uh, to what I want it to be. So when, even when automatic alt text is added to an object, the warning sign still appears to let you know that you should review it and make any corrections and remove the text that says it was automatically generated so that it is a good description that will help people understand what it is. There's these three rectangles with the warning signs and they are not important for understanding the meaning of the slide. So I'm unchecking them. What that means is that I'm marking them decorative and they won't be read by the screen reader. And that's what I can do for these objects that are not important for understanding meaning. And, and once I do that, I don't need to specify any alt text for them. Now that I've taken care of all these warning signs in the list, um, the next step is I will get them into the order that I want. So I can drag and drop the items in the pane until I get them into the right order. 
And I can do that with the mouse, or if I'm navigating with the keyboard, I can use control up arrow and control down arrow to move those items up and down the list. So I'll just keep going through here and sort the objects until I get them into the order that I want. And then it'll be a lot easier for the screen reader user to understand the message on the slide. Okay, that is better. So now let's go um, and hear what that slide sounds like in the screen reader now. Slide 11 of Anar's Way. It's not just what we do, but how we do it that makes all the difference. Dinner party set, image, plan, blueprint, image, thoroughly research and thoughtfully design, execute, factory, image, efficiently produce with attention to every detail, deliver, delivery truck, group, provide with conveniency and outstanding service. So with the proper structure, order, and textual descriptions, I can easily understand the message on the slide. A few other things to keep in mind. The reading order pane is only available in PowerPoint for Windows so far. On Mac PowerPoint and PowerPoint Online, you can use the selection pane instead to view the order of the objects and to reorder them. But the objects are listed in the reverse of the order that they're read in, in the selection pane. The internal ordering of the objects that defines how the screen reader reads them is also the order in which the objects visually stack. There'll be some cases where you can't get the ideal reading order of the objects because you need them to stack in a particular order for the visual look of the slide. Let's listen to how the screen reader reads this slide. Rejuvenating lounger. Knowledge tower. Creator's workbench. Trophy with solid fill. Image. Customer favorite. So it says something about customer favorite, and I'm a little confused about what that means. I don't know if uh, the last product, the Creator's Workbench, is the customer favorite, or if it's all three. It's, uh, it's not that clear to me. Uh, what has happened here is that customer favorite is a separate object from the object that contains the three product names, and they just happen to be positioned in a way that they line up and that communicates which one is the favorite product. But that positioning does not come through when the screen reader reads it, so they're not getting that information and they don't understand the message. So uh, what I can do instead to make it uh, clearer to the screen reader user is I can take this set of objects and group them together and specify an alt text that explains uh, what's going on here. So I'm going to do that, and then let's hear what the what it sounds like in the screen reader. Rejuvenating lounger, knowledge tower is customer favorite, creator's workbench, group. So that makes it much clearer. So that's a technique you can use uh, to make sure that people understand the content on your slides. I want to make this uh, slide more uh, impactful and engaging, and I'm going to use Designer to do that quickly and easily. It's going to show me some design suggestions, and I'll choose the one I want. And let's take a look in the reading order pane. That arc shape is already marked decorative, and the picture of the mountain already has good alt text, and the objects are already in a logical order. So. Uh, even though I created this slide automatically in Designer, a lot of the work to make it accessible has already been done, so there's a lot less work for me to do. Let's listen to how the screen reader reads the link on the slide. Link https colon slash slash one drv dot ms slash w slash s exclamation point n g j two v two d j four c i v j w n m r q v w q so zero f k q question mark e equal sign v g b pick. Okay, that's intense. Um, so as a sighted user, when I look at that, I don't know what that links to. Um, I see that as cryptic, and then I just kind of gloss over it. 
But for the screen reader user, they have to endure that long and painful message, and then they still don't know what it links to. So the best practice here is to set the link name uh, to a meaningful description of what you're linking to. So usually the title of the page or document that you're linking to, and it, you could use a URL if it's short and readable. So something like www.microsoft.com. Um, but if it's something long and cryptic like this URL, that's not something you should use. So I'll show you how to set the link name in PowerPoint. Select the text, and then click the link text button on the accessibility ribbon, and then you can type the link name. And that gets applied as the display text of the link. And that's also used by the screener as the name of the link that it reads. On this slide, the selected picture has a hyperlink. And when I click on link text, it opens up the alt text pane. The alt text of the picture is also used as the name of the hyperlink. So there's two important reasons why you need to set the alt text of that picture. Let's listen to how the screen reader reads the first couple cells of this table. Table, you aren't sure it will work when you need it to. Column one, row one, item. Products with reliability you can trust. Column two, row one. Item. So it read the content of the cells, but I'm a little bit confused about why they're even in a table or what the significance of the different columns are. And that's because there's no header row to let me know that. So to make the table easier to understand, add the header row. Let's listen to how the screen reader reads this table now. Table, columns, challenge, opportunity, four by two. Challenge, column header, column header, challenge, row one of four, column one of two. Opportunity, column header, column header, opportunity, column two of two. You aren't sure it will work when you need it to, column header, challenge, row two of four, column one of two. Products with reliability you can trust, column header, opportunity, column two of two. So now, as it's reading each table cell, it's also reading the associated column header and that makes it easier to understand the table and its structure. In this table, I have a merged cell in row three. Let's listen to how the screen reader reads that. Generative workspace, column header formal, row three of four, column one of two, merged cell spans two columns. Okay, it tells me that it's a merged cell, which is good. And it tells me the associated column header is formal, uh, which leads me to think that generative workspace is a formal product, but I'm not getting a clear message that it's also a casual product. Now tables are already pretty complex structure, and when you add merge cells, then they become even more complex. So consider if you can use a simpler structure without merge cells. That will make it easier to understand the table. Now, there'll be cases where maybe there isn't a good alternative and you really need to use merge cells, and that's okay. But really consider if you can avoid it because that's going to make it easier for people to understand. So here is the table without merge cells. We can hear what it sounds like in the screen reader. Generative workspace, column header formal, Row three of four, column one of two. Generative workspace, column header casual, column two of two. So now it's very clear that generative workspace is both a formal product and a casual product. And I don't have to, um, you know, think so hard to figure that out. One more thing you need to do to help people with uh, very low or no vision understand the content of your presentation is to add video descriptions to any uh, pre-recorded videos that you add. That describes what's happening in the video so that people who can't see it can understand it better. Here's an example. A busy city street, Maya with her guide dog. Good boy, steady. 
Steady, good boy. Aaron Luridson, Lighthouse, San Francisco. So in the natural pauses in the dialogue, we hear a voice describing uh, what's going on in the video so that people who can't see can understand it. So this is something that you'll need to do when you're producing the video uh, before you insert it into PowerPoint. So now you know all the things you need to do to make your presentation accessible to people with very low or no vision, including making it work well with the screen reader. One more thing you need to do is make your presentation accessible to people who are deaf or hard of hearing by adding captions and subtitles. Captions are for the deaf and hard of hearing and include descriptions of sounds as well as words. Things like phone ringing and dog barking. Subtitles are typically used for viewers that speak a different language and they may not include descriptions of sounds. So even though there's a technical difference between captions and subtitles, it's really about the content of the text and not the technology. Um, and the, the feature in the product to display text synchronized with the video is for both captions and subtitles. And that's why you'll often see those terms used uh, together or interchangeably. Um, so even though there's a technical difference about the type of content, they're really about uh, synchronized text with video. Open captions are rendered into the pixel of the video, so they're always on. Very simple. Closed captions is another option. You can store the captions as text separate from the video pixels. You can store them in the video file, or you can store them in a separate file from the video. So if they're in the video file, they're called in-band, and if they're in a separate file, they're called out-of-band. In either way, you can have multiple closed caption tracks for the same video. And the viewer gets to choose whether they're on or off and which track to play. So if you are using open captions or in-band closed captions, those are things you need to uh, put into your video using your video app before you insert that video into PowerPoint. Um, if you are using out-of-band closed captions, then that is something that you will insert into PowerPoint separately from the video. And PowerPoint for Windows supports out-of-band closed captions in WebVTT format, and I'll show you how that works. So you can select the video. You'll see an accessibility checker. There's a warning that you need to have captions on videos. You can choose the insert caption command either from accessibility checker or the accessibility ribbon, and you can select a file and insert it. And now that caption file is associated with that video. You can repeat that process for every caption track you want to add to that video. And then when you play the video, there will be a caption icon on the right side of the play bar. Click that and you can choose which caption track you want to play. We certainly hear that there are things that we can do better and gaps that we need to close. We don't just want to stop there. We want to really push beyond. Well, that was a lot but now you know how to make your presentations accessible. Everything I talked about today is covered in the uh, conference handouts, including uh, the list of features that we discussed and which um, platforms each of the features is available in. So take a look at that if you have any questions about that. And please stay in touch with us as you continue on this journey of making your presentations accessible. Thank you so much. Have a great day.